All right, so basically, we're going to find out in just a couple of days about the Dodge Charger EV for 2024. So um, they're talking about the things that we know so far. So they're saying, yeah, Dodge is introducing an all-electric Charger, making it one of the only muscle EVs on the market. The brand is redefining what it means to be a muscle car. The Charger EV will offer different trim options and the ability to upgrade horsepower. Dodge is keeping performance enhancements in-house and is dedicated to its EV models. See, right then and there, that's where they're going to start rolling eyes, and that's where they're going to start losing interest. Some of these people, they want to be able to uh, do modifications to these cars, and they want to be able to do that like wherever they want to go to modify them. That's not happening with these cars. When you open up the hood on one of these things, what you're going to see is you're going to see a bunch of very bright orange wires, and those are high-voltage wires. You're not allowed to touch any of that shit. If you do, you void your warranty on top of probably electrocuting yourself. They're making it so that whatever gets done to these cars, they're going to be responsible for it. So you know what that means? It means microtransactions. It's just like how when you're on your PlayStation 5 and your Xbox and you want to uh, put a new uh, uh, uniform on one of them uh, players that you're playing, like with NBA 2K3000 or whatever, yeah, well, you're going to have to pay them directly for a performance upgrade. So that means you, you, you pull out your credit card and you swipe it, and you say, yeah, I want 100 more horsepower. It's like, oh, okay, great. That's going to cost you $500, and, and then they just do it. So bottom line is, you. I know some people probably think, yeah, I'll be able to just take it to one of my uh, buddies, and he'll have a computer, and he can just unlock it. It's like, no, it's not going to work that way. And if you do, you'll probably void your warranty. So if your car does burn down because you did something to it that you weren't supposed to do, uh, yeah, you're not getting any of your money back and your warranty is voided and you're unable to sue because you tampered with the vehicle and you weren't supposed to. They say the Charger EV is expected to have an impressive range of around 500 miles. I don't believe that at all. And if they do have a 500 mile range somehow, I believe that that would have to cost somewhere like $150,000 to $200,000. I don't believe that at all. I will say right now that unless they surprise me, I believe that this thing is going to have a range somewhere between 300 and maybe 400 miles. Possibly 300. I I'm leaning more towards 300. Okay, it says it's easy to assume that the age of muscle cars is coming to an end as electrification takes hold and automakers are forced to ditch the internal combustion engine. For everyday cars, pickup trucks, and SUVs, electrification isn't that big a deal as long as we can get past range anxiety, charging times, and sticker prices. When it comes to sports cars, muscle cars, on the other hand, there aren't too many enthusiasts out there who are madly in love with the idea of ditching fuel, fire, and burbly exhaust for electrons, charging cables, and fake engine noise. Dodge, however, sat down and evaluated the question, what is blah, 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 blah. Let's get to some numbers. But there's no, there are no numbers. They haven't released anything. It says, update on February 7th. This post has been refreshed with new information regarding the 2025 Charger EV, including confirmed battery specs, range, horsepower pricing, and its official debut, March 5th as Dodge's first dive into electric muscle car manufacturing. It will be interesting to see how this model fares once it hits the market. Uh, is there anything else of interest? Uh, it looks like it's not. So, yeah, I mean, that's the car. I don't know how much it's really, have you know, changing. Um, it says you'll also see things like a unibody chassis and a flat, high-performance battery with 100 to 110 kilowatt capacity. Okay, let me help you out because I know that a lot of you don't understand electric vehicles. Um, power delivery as in the verb like the movement power delivery is measured in kilowatts storage however is measured in kilowatt hours now to be very simple about that my cadillac lyric has a 102 kilowatt hour battery when you charge that vehicle the 
fast chargers that I go to are usually DC fast chargers that charge somewhere between 40 and 60 kilowatts. So that's the verb of them actually charging. They are putting that much power into the battery, right? Now, you'd think that that sounds like a lot, but the reality is even a DC fast charger charging between 40 and 60 kilowatts per whatever amount of time. The problem is that as the battery starts to fill, the charger slows down. And it does that to protect the battery and, I guess, to protect the health of the car or something. But um, bottom line is this. If this car does have a 100 kilowatt hour battery, there's nothing wrong with that because that's basically exactly what I have. What it means, however, to you is that let's say you go to a charger like the Tesla charges. Let's say they're charging you 50 cents per kilowatt hour. Well, the math is very simple. If it takes you 50 cents per kilowatt hour and you have to charge your battery to 100 kilowatts, you simply multiply 100 kilowatts times 50 cents. That would mean $50 is how much it's going to cost you to charge. It's very simple, actually. Now, you're not usually going to charge from zero to 100. Most people uh, typically don't charge to 100% anyway. Most people charge to about 85%, and that's to protect the health of the battery. So 85% and a 100 kilowatt hour battery, you're basically talking about 280 miles worth of range that you can drive. Now, does that mean that you can drive 280 miles? No, it does not. What it means is that you can drive possibly up to 280 miles. So if you have the heater on or you've got the air conditioner blowing, your mileage is going to decrease based on how much electricity you're using inside the car. So if you have a 280 mile range from a full charge, chances are you're going to probably only drive somewhere around 200 miles because you're using so much electricity in other aspects of the car. Like maybe your heater, maybe your air conditioner, maybe your heated seats, maybe your cooled seats, whatever it is. Not only that, but the car actually uses some of its own energy in order to heat or cool the battery. Usually it's to heat the battery in case it starts to get very cold. So... Do, do I believe that they're going to have a 500-mile range? Absolutely not. And the reason why is because the Lucid Air offers like a 400-mile range, but that car costs way over $100,000. There's no way Dodge has given you uh, anywhere near 500 miles range. It's not happening. Now, as far as the battery size being 100 to 110 kilowatts, oh, yeah, that's very well possible. But right now, obviously, they don't know exactly how big this battery is. A 100-kilowatt battery is probably going to be good to give you a number somewhere around 300 miles worth of range. Depending upon how efficient the car is, chances are you may see 250 out of that 300. It depends. It really depends. But we'll have to wait and see. All right. So it says, as it turns out, there will be two different trim classes. What the fuck? Okay, as it turns out, there'll be two different trim classes. The Charger 340 and the Charger 440. And it's very base form. The Charger EV will be good for 440 horsepower. Now, let me just say this. 440 horsepower, if that is the base form, 440 horsepower is nothing. My Cadillac Lyric has two motors and it produces 500 horsepower. And that 0 to 60 is about 5.5 seconds. So 440 is nothing. So my guess is that if they're saying that the base charger, this is my guess. Now, I, I can't prove this because we got to wait and see what they finally say. But if they're saying that the base charger EV will have 440 horsepower, then what they're saying is that it'll be a single motor, rear-wheel drive, and it'll be 440 horsepower, which is 
you're talking about zero to 60 in about maybe five seconds. May, like they'll probably try to say like 4.9 or something. Um, but it'll probably be zero to 60 somewhere around five seconds. Let's, let's say, yeah, let's, let's give it that number. Zero to 60 in about five seconds, 4.9, somewhere around there. Now, what would make sense at that point is for them to offer the dual motor version and the dual motor version would be all wheel drive and that all wheel drive adding that second motor would add maybe another 440 or possibly a little bit more depending upon where they're putting that motor that might give you close to 800 horsepower or maybe even 900 horsepower so that would definitely make it a lot faster you'd probably be able to do zero to 60 let's say under four seconds but we won't know until they actually release the uh, final details. But understand something, and I'm going to get into this in a minute. In order to really be competitive with the other performance EV out there, which you're probably not going to be because now we've got cars like the Remac Nevera and the Tesla Plaid and everything. These things are doing 0 to 60 in 2 seconds. Um, some of them are able to beat that. And then Elon Musk claims that he's going to have thrusters or some shit and he's going to make the uh, Tesla Roadster capable of doing zero to 60 in like one second. Now it's possible for him to make a claim like that. It's possible they already have a working prototype, but, uh, I have to believe, I have to see it to believe it. So, um, the 340, in my opinion, and you, and you can wait and see what actually gets said. I believe the 340 will be, if it's the base version, I believe it'll be rear wheel drive. I believe the 440 will be a dual motor. In order for them to get more power out of these EVs, what they end up having to do is they have to add a dual motor and they have to add a tri-motor, three motors. So the Tesla Plaid, the Lusa Sapphire, which I'll talk about in a minute, those have three motors. Now, you could go all out and say, yeah, well, we're going to have a quad motor like the, uh, uh, what is it called, the... Um, uh, Rivian R1T and the Rivian R1S. And yeah, those things are very, very fast. It's just that they weigh a lot. So, you know, those and those are trucks and S, those are SUV slash truck. It's it's a it's a two use uh model, like where you can make it a truck or you can make it an SUV. So they have quad motors. And uh yeah, that thing's really, really powerful. But uh when you're looking at like the current tri motors, you're looking at the Tesla Plaid, and you're looking at the Cyber Beast, the Tesla Cyber Beast Cyber Truck, and uh, you've seen a couple of videos probably about those how fast they are. So anyway, it says the same deal goes for the Charger 440. It says which starts out at 590. The DC Stage One kit pushes total system output to 630, while the DC Stage Two kit bumps you up to 670. But we're leaving an era where Dodge ha was extracting more horsepower from a V8 engine. Uh, it says like the Demon 170 was capable of 1,025. Now, I want you to keep in mind, if you go right now and you look at Drag Time's video of the Tesla Plaid versus the Demon 170, the Demon 170 lost every single race one by one in a row to that Tesla Plaid. It's not easy to beat an all-wheel drive car that's been designed with electric motors. It's really not easy to do. It's not easy to beat one of those things. It's really not. Um, all-wheel drive basically means that that thing is going to grip and grip and grip. Even if it has to shred its tires to dust, it's going to just, it's just going to deliver all of that power right to the ground. It's not going to do any wheelies. It's not going to, uh, it's not, you're not going to get transmission slips because there is no transmission. It's just a fucking drive motor and it's direct drive. Like th these motors are amazing. Like when you drive with a, a electric vehicle and you drive it on the highway, you realize right away, you're like, yeah, most of these gas cars, they can't keep up with this thing simply because of how it delivers its power. But, um. What does it say? It says, the solution to that problem is the Dodge Charger Banshee. Unlike the other models that we've discussed here, the Banshee will run on an 800-volt architecture. All that basically means is that it has two banks of 400-volt batteries. 400 plus 400 equals 800. And it charges faster because when you plug that charger in, it splits up the energy 
to one bank and the second bank. So you're charging two banks simultaneously rather than just charging one bank. Uh, it says, like the lesser models, there will be a base model Banshee and the ability to install two different upgrades. How much power the Banshee has from the factory is a mystery, as is how much horsepower the DC kits will add to the mix. Now, it says, note, it would make sense considering the 440 DC stage tops out at 670. Then again, the difference between the 349 DC2 and base level 440 is 65 horsepower. So the Banshee could go well beyond 707 horsepower. But see, here's the problem. You can't think in terms of horsepower alone when you're talking about an electric vehicle because the thing you have to remember is these electric vehicles weigh a lot. My Cadillac Lyric weighs more than my Jeep SRT. Now, my Jeep SRT has 475 horsepower with a 6.4 liter Hemi but it weighs like 5,200 pounds. My Cadillac Lyric weighs 6,000 pounds and has 500 horsepower, and it takes 5.5 seconds to get to uh, 60. So it's, not, it's just not the same thing. And when you have an electric vehicle and you're dealing with all-wheel drive, the performance is not the same as if you had a similarly sized at a similarly weighing gas car. It's just not the same. But the bottom line is, all you got to do right now is go to uh, Drag Time's videos, and you can watch a Demon 170 get murdered over and over and over again by a Tesla Plaid. Also, there's a video of the Lucid Sapphire and the Tesla Plaid versus the Bugatti Chiron. The Bugatti Chiron is $4 million dollars, and it has a W16 engine with four turbochargers generating, I think it's more than 1,200 horsepower, if I'm not mistaken. Either it's 1,200 or 1,500. Bottom line is, that thing lost every single race to the Lucid Sapphire. Um, yeah, it's just, it's not exactly the same thing. A 1,500 horsepower V8 versus a 1200 horsepower electric vehicle chances are the electric vehicle may actually end up with the benefit but you know you you could go watch the videos yourself uh you could see it yourself i can't play it here because obviously i get a, a youtube copyright and i'm not trying to do that but uh that's the bottom line. okay so right now the speed kings are the lucid sapphire and the tesla model s plaid i guess you could also include the tesla model x Plaid, but since uh, the Model X is, you know, more of a crossover on stilts, and the uh, Model S is actually a four door sedan, I'm not going to include the uh, Model X right now. The Model X and the uh, Model S will both easily beat a demon, as you've seen from Drag Times videos. But um, the reality is, these are the Speed Kings, and these things cost a lot of money. The Tesla Model S Plaid has 1,020 horsepower, and it needs three motors, three electric motors, in order to generate the uh, power and in order to generate the performance that it does. And, you know, you're talking about $100,000. I think when it first came out, they were going for about one forty to one fifty. Um, I think the cheapest you could have gotten one years ago was like one thirty. but from what I know, Tesla lowered the price of them, and now they're about 100000 then there's the Lucid Sapphire. I haven't seen one of those in person yet, but I've driven the regular Lucid, and I was actually very impressed by the performance. The uh, Lucid Sapphire has three motors, and it has 1,200 horsepower. So basically what you're saying is, in order for you to generate these ridiculous performance numbers, in order for you to get under nine seconds, you're talking about somewhere in between 100000 and 200000 or $250,000, right? So the question is, how is Dodge going to be able to compete with that and still make an electric vehicle that is affordable? And the, the answer, in my opinion, is they're not because there's no way that they're going to be able to compete with uh, Tesla's Plaid mode or the Lucid Sapphire. There's no way they're going to be able to compete with those cars and still make a car that you can actually afford. See, the reality is Dodge's consumer base, they ain't got that much money. 
Like, I know there's a couple of people who are buying Demon 170s and who bought Demons and they're gaming the system because they're speculating on the price going up, so they consider them assets. But the average Dodge buyer, you know, these Charger and Challengers, you're talking about people who are getting themselves hooked into ninja loans. And they're basically stuck paying, like, you know, 10% interest for, like, the next eight years. I'm hearing people say, oh, yeah, well, I expect that the price should be on par with what we pay for a scat pack or what we pay for a Hellcat. I can tell you right now, there's no way that that's happening. See, one of the interesting things about uh, Dodge Chrysler and Jeep, and th this is also part of the reason why I think they really royally screwed themselves. They could have had, and I've said this before, they could have had four cars. They could have had the Magnum, the 300, the Charger, and the Challenger. They could have had four cars, all sharing parts. They could have had a Magnum Hellcat, a Magnum Pentastar V6. They could have had a Magnum, uh, what is it called, uh, Red Eye. They could have had the Magnum uh, 5.7. You could have had the 300 5.7, the 300 Hellcat, the 300 Red Eye. Instead, they dropped those possibilities by canceling the Magnum, number one. And then what they did was they uh, dropped the um, all-wheel drive V8 option out of the Chrysler 300. And to tell you the truth, the all-wheel drive 5.7... 300 is the whole reason why I bought into Chrysler in the first place. If you remember, my first 300 was a um, 6.1 Hemi SRT 300. And I only bought that because I had driven my friend's 5.7 Hemi C. And this was way back in 2006. And um, having driven that car, I was really excited about the product. So I actually went and bought the SRT model. Then after that, I traded up to the 2012 6.4 liter Chrysler 300 in black. And then after that, I got the Hellcat Dodge Charger 6.2 liter supercharged, right? So bottom line is Dodge Chrysler, they screwed up entirely. There was no reason to cancel the Magnum. Supposedly, they say, oh, yeah, well, there was some guy during the bailout era. They don't name names, but they were like, oh, yeah, well, somebody said it. You know, we should get rid of it. So let's just understand. They got rid of the Magnum, and they give you the fucking Dodge Hornet. And the Dodge Hornet right now is one of the most not-selling cars that there possibly is that has ever not sold. That's how bad it is. They have, like, an inventory on that car for, for, for like, years, basically. It's, it's really that bad. They have more than a year's worth of those cars in inventory. See, unfortunately, these Italians, they, for whatever reason... Not only don't they like American cars, but they also, for whatever reason, they think Americans are small people or some shit. Americans are not small people. I've said this before. Because of Dodge, and I'll guess maybe, you know, because of GM and Ford, Americans want cars that are big, huge, and fucking fast. That's the bottom line. In fact, I swear to God, if I ran a car company, that would be our model. We build cars that are big, huge, and fucking fast. And I'm pretty sure I'd probably do some pretty good business. But uh, these Italians, and this started with Sergio Marconi. He kept trying to push all this Alfa Romeo bullshit on us. I can go right now to any of the Fiat dealers, any of the Alfa Romeo dealers, any of the Maserati dealers, and I can show you yards filled with cars that nobody wants. I barely see Maserati. That's like one of the worst cars you could possibly buy. It's overpriced. The reliability sucks. And the depreciation curve is, is abysmal. And then there's the Fiats, which, you know, starting from the 500. I remember when they were trying to generate all this excitement over that stupid little car, the Fiat 500 of Barth. Oh, yeah, well, this thing is amazing. It's got a manual. Never, yeah, yeah, okay, great. It's got a manual, and it's really fucking small, and, like, the average person can't fit in it. And I was like, listen, if I was a little five-foot-nothing Italian woman who's driving up and down the streets of Sicily, yeah, maybe it would make sense for me. But guess what? I'm damn near six-foot-seven, and I weigh as much as a defense lineman. So no, I'm not getting into no damn Fiats. So those cars sat there and collected dust. They're trying to give those cars away. Uh, you go by the, uh, what is it called, the Alfa Romeo dealer. They're trying to give away those shitty Julia's. 
They're trying to give away those stupid uh, tonalis. Nobody wants them. So then what they do, oh, well, maybe these Americans are dumb enough to buy the Alfa Romeo Tonali if we change the name and call it the Dodge Hornet. And that's why those cars are sitting on the lot right now. There's, I, I, I have no idea what's going on with all these Europeans trying to push this garbage on us. It looks to me like, number one, they hate American cars. I, I remember when Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear tried to run the uh, 300 SRT8 against a BMW M something, and it had a V10 engine in it, and there was a video of that on Top Gear. And I'm like, wait a minute. How the hell are you running a 300 SRT up against a freaking multi-hundred-thousand-dollar BMW with a V10 engine. Like, what are you doing? But they, he, he, he had nothing but negative to say about that car. He hated that car. I loved it, but he hated that car. And the reality is, these Europeans, they hate our cars. They don't like Dodge. They hate Dodge. First of all, they don't even sell Dodge in their countries because Dodge doesn't make right-hand drive cars. They only make left-hand drive cars. Canada and America, yeah, we're fine with that. Uh, they don't want that. What they want is they want global platforms that they can sell all over the world. So the reality is they have no respect for our cars at all. They have no respect. They don't respect our cars. I, I think the average one of them somehow believes that the average American is like five foot ten and weighs like 150 pounds or something. I, I have no idea what these people are thinking because we know that's not true. But the bottom line is they're selling a shit. And uh, it's not selling. It's just sitting there at the lot. It's good for them. So why do I say all that? Um, I think they really went wrong by not taking advantage. They, they could have had four cars sharing parts. They could have added in the Ram if they really wanted to. They could have added in the Ram and put the Hellcat engine in it, put the 5.7, put the 6.4. Okay, fine. Same thing with the Jeep. Instead of you know having a stupid Jeep Trackhawk, which is discontinued, by the way, uh, what you could have had was you could have had the 6.4, the 6.2, and the 5.7, and you have the 3.6. You you would have been able to sell that car with, like, four different engines. The, the Ram truck, the Jeep, you could have sold that damn thing with four different, either one, with four different engines, and you still got the Dodge Durango. You could have had that four different engines. They, I don't, well, no, but see, I, I would say I don't know what's going on with them, but I do know what's going on with them. The Italians are shutting them down, and that's what's going to happen. Dodge is basically dead in a couple of uh, years. I think, I'll give them about maybe five or six years before Stellantis considers them non-profitable, or they, their sales go so poorly until they end up bankrupt. It'll be one or the other. I, I don't know, but I, I'll give them, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll be generous. I'll give you 10 years. But I don't think it's even going to take that long. I think they're on their way out. So um, when we see this unveiling of this uh, Dodge EV, the main thing you got to understand, because I've heard some people talking about it, and I've heard people talking about it who don't understand electric cars at all. Obviously, I understand electric vehicles. Um, 800 volts is simply an architecture. What it basically means is you have two 400-volt systems plugged together. And when you charge the vehicle, in many cases, the way it's designed is that when you plug that vehicle in and you're fast charging, you're charging two different banks of batteries, 400-volt batteries. And 400 volts you know, times two is 800. So it may be set up in a way where you're charging two different banks of batteries simultaneously in order to charge the whole vehicle faster. The other thing 800 volt architecture does is it makes the uh, vehicle uh, more efficient. And in some cases, it also removes the uh, necessity of a 12 volt battery because the way most of these cars have been made up until this point is you have a 12 volt battery just like we have in our regular cars. And that 12 volt battery runs a lot of the accessories and a lot of the uh, features inside the car. And it also helps obviously with the engine starter. But the high voltage battery that you have in the floor, that one is basically relegated specifically to driving the car and to making the car move. So all of these cars basically have what they call the skateboard style battery, where the entire floor of the car is a battery. And that's the high voltage system. Meanwhile, you have like a small 12 volt battery 
that helps run most of the car's features and accessories when the car is not actually moving. When you upgrade to the 800 volt architecture, however, it's possible to remove that 12 volt battery. It's possible for you to run everything off of the 800 volt architecture. In time, the technology is going to improve even more. We have no idea where the technology will be five, ten years from now because they're still working on most of that stuff. But what it does is it helps the car charge faster and it helps the um, efficiency to improve. So as it is, the car that you see this driving in this uh, video, this is the refreshed Model 3 Highland, right? Now, this thing has just been released uh, with the all-wheel drive and the rear-wheel drive models. And there is a uh, higher performance model coming soon. And they believe at this point that the high performance model may cost up to $60,000. Now, keep in mind, you look inside this car, there's basically nothing but seats and a steering wheel. And then there's that iPad, which basically you have to go through that for everything. Now, Dodge is most likely going to use legacy parts. They may end up using a lot of the parts that you currently see in the current new revised Jeep Grand Cherokees. Now, the reason I say that is because I, I saw their Wagoneer S, and I, I could put a photo in this video. And the uh, Wagoneer S that they were showing is an electric Jeep. Basically, it's supposed to replace the Grand Cherokee because they stopped using the Grand Cherokee name because the Indians supposedly claimed it was racist. So the reality is the parts that are in those pictures, we already recognize because those parts are currently in the Jeep Grand Cherokee now. So my guess is that based on what, what I'm seeing, a lot of the legacy parts that they're currently still making, you're going to see a lot of those parts in the uh, the Wagoneer S, and you're going to see it in the Dodge Charger, Challenger, whatever they release, this, uh, this Banshee concept, whatever it is. So they're about to um, unveil this stuff, and I'm guessing that you're going to see a lot of those parts there. So if they're saying that this thing is going to have 800-volt architecture, then what all that means is that it's going to be able to charge faster with the DC fast supercharging, um, and it'll, it'll be efficient. So, you know, you may be able to get uh, between 300 and 400 miles range. I personally believe, and, you know, we're going to find out soon, I personally believe that it's going to be under 400 miles of range. And the reason why I say that is because right now the only car companies that are giving you close to 400 miles range is like Mercedes EQS, I think the EQE long range model, and then there's Lucid with their Lucid Air long range model. It's like, I think it's the Grand Touring where you get between 400 and 500 miles. And the bottom line is, if they do tell you that it's 300 miles range, or they do tell you it's 400 miles range, I'm going to tell you right now, as an EV owner, and I think most EV owners can attest, if they tell you whatever range they tell you, subtract about 80 miles from whatever the range they tell you, and that's going to be the real mile that you'll get in the real world. Now, the reason why I say that, um, I bought my Cadillac Lyric in, on January 2nd. We've had a couple of very, very cold days. In fact, we've had a lot of cold days. In fact, right now, it's 51 degrees, but for the majority of most of these past weeks, it's been like in the 30s. Uh, very rarely have I seen in the 20s, but for the most part, it's been somewhere around the 30s. While these cars are sitting still, and you may have heard about this because you heard those stories, the horror stories from Tesla up in Alberta, Canada. If it's very cold outside, these cars tend to use energy in order to heat themselves. That's called preconditioning. Um, if you're about to go to a supercharger and you let the car know that you're about to go to a supercharger, the car may heat itself using its own energy from the battery in order to prepare the car to charge at a charger. So the bottom line is these cars can be sitting still and they're using battery power in order to condition the battery. That's when it gets very, very cold. Now, if you're in a situation where like, you know, here in New York, it doesn't get extremely hot. It doesn't get extremely cold. But if you're at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, like uh, spring or 
entry summer. Or if, as long as you're not dealing with crazy Texas temperatures, like it's 120 outside or something like that, 110, it's not that bad. The car doesn't have to really do much when it's warmer. But when it's freezing, that's when the car is going to use a lot of its power to uh, condition the battery. So that's the bottom line. So I say all that to say this. If they tell you 300 miles, then realistically, you're going to see like 220, especially if it's cold. If they tell you 400 miles, realistically, you're going to see like 300 and like 10, 320, somewhere around that. Now, if you live in certain climates, you may not have that problem. But if you live in a very, very cold place, like if you're like in Alberta or you're in like Alaska or something, yeah, it's, you're going to have a problem seeing that kind of range. It's not going to happen. For, for simple, you know, thermodynamic reasons, it's just not going to happen. The laws of thermodynamics aren't going to allow that to happen. So um, that's the bottom line. Now, I'm not saying all that to say that, you know, nobody's going to buy it because we all know that there's some people who absolutely will buy it simply because they want something new. And that's part of the reason why I know electric vehicles are ultimately going to do well. Right now, nothing's doing well. Interest rates are high. If you try to buy just about any car, you're talking about 8%, 10%, 12% interest on these cars right now. Um Really, right now, nothing is doing very well. In fact, right now, Tesla is actually doing pretty well, specifically because, um, you know, 2023, the Model Y was pretty much the best-selling car in the world. Um, some of these companies, I've noticed a lot of these, uh, like Toyota BRZs on the road, Toyota has been giving 1.9% interest rates as long as you're financing or leasing through them. I've also seen that there are 0% interest rates being offered in some cases for electric vehicles as long as you're a well-qualified buyer and whatnot. So the bottom line is most cars in general are not selling very well. But um, as long as there's like a decent lease or decent finance options, that's the only thing that's actually moving most of these cars. So there's a lot of people who are probably going to buy the Dodge EV, simply because they want something new. Or maybe they just want to be the first person with it. You know, I, I don't really think there's a whole lot of people saving up money specifically for it. But I do believe that there's a lot of people who would buy it just because they want to have something brand new and they want to be the first person with it. I, I absolutely believe that. So it, it is what it is. But um, I'm going to be waiting to see what details they release on this thing. I'm absolutely going to be waiting to see it. And um, as soon as they do release all the official details, then I'll be able to talk about it a little bit more succinctly. But uh, the bottom line is, I don't believe that the average Dodge buyer at current is excited for an EV. I'm pretty sure they're not. <coughs> I'm pretty sure that the average Dodge buyer, I think right now they're probably feeling disappointed. I would also say that they're probably feeling abandoned. And I think the last time people felt that way was probably, I would have to say, it's, it's been a while, but I, I would say it's probably during the time when Dodge started putting the Hellcat out and GM and Ford couldn't compete. Because I remember back then, like the Hellcat, that was a really, really powerful car and there was nothing that was coming anywhere close to it in terms of raw power, with the exception of like the all-wheel drive high-performance cars, like say the Nissan GTR. And then, of course, there was the Tesla when they made the insane mode, and then they made the ludicrous mode. And at that point, once they had ludicrous mode, it was like none of these Dodge cars could compete with that. And then they went and made the plaid mode. And then at that point, yeah, they couldn't get they they were untouchable. They were made, those cars. On like the plaid mode kills a Demon 170 over and over and over and over and over because it's just so goddamn fast. It does see the thing about it is while that demon is doing that little pop a wheelie bullshit, it's losing time. And meanwhile, that Tesla is just flying off like a fucking spaceship. And that's just what it is. It's like spinning ain't winning. So the reality is understand something. If they do make 
how should I say, an affordable version of this uh, Charger EV, whatever they're going to call it when they announce the name. Mark my words, you're looking at no less than about $60,000. If somehow they announce it and say it's less than $60,000, you can bet that the dealer markups are going to make it more expensive than $60,000. Just you can bet that that's going to happen. I would say that the highest performance vehicle that they make, that's, if it's an EV, I would say that you're looking more like closer to eighty, ninety thousand dollars. You're probably looking at Hellcat numbers, or you're probably looking at even Demon numbers, and and that's just where it is. So we're gonna find out. They say it's March fifth. Uh, what is it like eleven o'clock or something? I'm gonna be paying attention. I'm gonna be waiting and listening, and I and I'm anxious to find out about uh, how much the official numbers are and what it's gonna cost and all that. But the reality is I already expect that this thing is going to be – it's going to be way more expensive than what we current – like the SCAD packs and all that stuff. This thing is going to be more expensive than that. The mere fact that Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y have bare minimum of interiors and that these things cost like 40000 to 50000 or even close to $60,000 between forty and sixty. There's no way Dodge is giving you anything better than that for less money than that. Because at this point, Tesla it's Tesla pretty much is running the show when it comes to low-end EVs. They're running the show. And when it comes to high-end EVs, yeah, you got the Germans putting out this stuff. You got like the Rolls-Royce uh, Spectre. You got the EQS, the EQE, the BMW iX, the Audi e-trons. But the problem with all of them has ultimately been the charging situation. So it's like no matter how expensive your EV is, you're still stuck with a charging situation. Now, if you have a house, you can charge your EV at your house. No problem. You can charge your EV you can get 300, maybe even 400 miles, and you can charge your EV at home, and it's going to cost you between 10 and possibly $15 to charge each time you charge it. Oh, that's no problem at all. The problem comes, however, when you want to venture out far into other states or something like that, and now you're forced to rely on public charging. EVgo, Electrify America. Um... I've made a number of videos about EVgo. I haven't used Electrify America yet, but uh, I've made a number of videos about EVgo. And here inside New York City, EVgo is like nowhere to be found. Um, there's like the, the closest chargers are like Massapequa. And then after that, you're talking about going deep into Long Island. Otherwise, you have to go to like New Jersey or Connecticut or something. So basically what I'm saying is you basically have to drive 20 or 30 miles to get to the nearest charger. For me, the nearest charger is like 10 miles away. And uh, that's the EVgo network. Now, the Electrify America network, yeah, the uh, chargers are a little bit closer. There's like uh, some 7, 8 miles away, maybe even 10 miles away. Uh, there's also some charge points but uh, right now, I charge for free because I have a two-year uh, free charging with EVgo because I bought a Cadillac. After that's over, I'll be charging at home pretty much exclusively because at that point, there'd be no reason for me to use a public charger. Now, for all the rest of these people, you got no choice but to either use the public charging network or to get the adapter for your car if you need it and then use Tesla's network. Now, if that's the case, you're going to have Dodge EV owners who are charging at Tesla stations. And I don't know how the Tesla owners are going to feel about that, but I have a pretty good idea that the Dodge owners may or may not like that too much, especially considering they're going to have to pay Tesla money in order to charge their cars. So it's, it's going to come down to EVgo, Electrify America, or the Tesla chargers if you want DC fast charging. It's going to come down to one of those three for the most part. Most of these people who are Dodge owners, Charger Challenger owners, even Jeep owners, a lot of these people do not have houses. A lot of these people 
they are, if they're going to charge, they're going to have no choice but to use public charges because they don't have garages and they don't have a house where they can put a public charger onto the side of the house. And that's just the bottom line. A lot of these cars are parked right out on the street. That's why you see Charger and Challenger theft is so freaking high. Uh, wheel theft, entire car theft, it's, it's very, very high. These people are parking these cars out on the street. Not only that, a lot of them, I'm pretty sure, they're not going to want to be you know, prone. They're not going to want to have to sit still. A lot of these people... They, they're so used to just getting gas in like three or four minutes or whatever it is and then just leaving. A lot of these people, don't they don't want to sit still. You know, like a lot of these people, the last thing they want is for somebody to recognize them sitting still at a, at a, at a public charger. Because, you know, somebody might try to run up on them and be like, hey, yo, hey, wait a minute. Yo, is that Pookie over there? Yo, that's Pookie over there. Oh, he's charging his car. Yo, he gonna be there for a while. Yo, 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 pass me that motherfucking guy. We gonna go over there and tighten Pookie's ass up. You know, you, you, you get what I'm saying. These are people who do not want to sit still. A lot of these people have to hide their cars. A lot of these people hide their cars in garages. They don't want nobody to know where they live. They don't want nobody to know where they park. So now they're gonna be prone in the open at a public charger. They don't want that. They don't want that at all. So I think that is going to hurt sales. You know, a lot of these people, they just want to, you know, they just want to uh, get their gas and they want to scurry back into their little apartment. What they don't want is to be stuck out in the open and to have people, you know, recognizing them in public. They don't want that. I'm pretty sure they don't want that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I think about it. Um, the charging situation, that is going to probably be the straw that breaks the camel's back when it, and, and, then, and I mean, that's just another straw because there's a number of other straws that are going to, you know, make it so that they may or may not want these cars. First of all, you already know that the dealers are going to mark these things up because these dealers are unscrupulous and they don't care. I think Stellantis is okay with being a low volume, high uh, MSRP seller. I think they're okay with that. Like, imagine if, uh, going to a Stellantis for Jeep or a Ram or something, imagine if you're paying Jaguar prices or Land Rover prices. I think they're okay with that. I, I don't think that, like, honestly, they may be trying to sink the brand for all I know. And, um, that's just what I think because it, there's no way that they're going to be able to sell these cars to people who just don't want them for various reasons. But I, I think ultimately the charging situation is going to be the problem. That's going to be the biggest issue that most of them have. I really believe that. So that's all I'm saying. I mean, you know, we're going to find out March 5th. I think the key things that you should be looking for, for what they're saying, the key things that you're going to be looking for, number one, how much does this thing cost? What's the price? Number two, what's the range that you get from a full charge? Then there's number three, what's the performance? And when I say the performance, if you're anything less than 700 horsepower, racing is not going to be something that you're doing with this thing. Because the reality is, in order to really race EVs, you've got to have like more than 900 horsepower. The uh, Rivian R1S, R1T has four motors, and that thing has uh, over 800 horsepower, and it's very, very quick. It's just that it runs out of steam after you, you know, reach the peak power on those motors. But when you're talking about the Plaid and the Lucid, you're talking about at least, you need at least 1,000 horsepower to really be taken seriously if you're going to try to race an EV. Now, your EV will easily be able to race these uh, gas cars in the quarter mile. But when it comes to racing other EVs, no, 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 no. The, the only number you want is more. So if you're saying that the Lucid Sapphire is 1,200 horsepower, now you're talking about in order for you just to be able to compete with that, you need at least 1,300 horsepower, maybe even more. Because keep in mind, when it comes to electric vehicles, in order for them to increase the performance of these things, all they really have to do is they have to change the fuses to make the fuses able to bear more load. And then after that, they have to um, pretty much, you know, do some software updates and whatnot. 
So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be really interesting. Just to, I'm, I'm anxious just to see what Dodge comes up with. And uh, that's basically that. So, yeah, we're looking for the price, looking for the performance. And hopefully they're giving you numbers, like they're giving you a zero to 60 time and a quarter mile time. But I think with Dodge, they, they know that they have no choice but to do that. But um, we already know that you're, you're going to get some fake engine noise. And that's unless they put that twin turbo hurricane engine in there. And, and by the way, for the people who are excited about that twin turbo hurricane engine, I drove that in the Grand Wagoneer. Just as I feared, that thing has turbo lag. Turbo lag comes from the problem that all turbocharged cars pretty much have where they have to spool those turbos up in order to produce low-end torque. Meanwhile, a V8 already produces low-end torque. That's why it gives you that, that immediate off-the-line power. Those twin turbo cars, they don't work that way. They don't get fast until they've already started moving. And uh, the reality is it's like those things, they don't have a lot of low-end torque. And when you add the turbo lag, it's like you, you could squash the pedal and it almost feels like for an infinitesimal amount of time, it feels like nothing's happening. I've experienced that with the Mercedes S-Class cars that have the twin turbo V8. I hated that. I would rather have a naturally aspirated V8 from the 2007 Mercedes S-Class than to have one of these 500 whatever by turbos. I would rather have the old engine. It was quieter and it produced that low end torque and it had a far better throttle response. Even when you drive into sport mode. What I do love about electric vehicles is electric vehicles have instantaneous torque. And, you know, from that point on, whatever your horsepower is, that's how fast that car is going to be able to get up to. And in order for you to go really, really fast, you, you need somewhere in the neighborhood of like 800 to 1,000. Or in the plaid's case, you need like 1,020, you know, in order to make sure that you can beat most other people to the quarter mile. But, um... Bottom line is that uh, I'm not excited for the turbocharged Hurricane engines in the Charger or the Child. I'm not excited for that at all. Um, personally, I prefer the electric vehicle. And the reason why is because the electric vehicle doesn't have a middleman. When you have a hybrid car, you're dealing with the complexity of the electric vehicle and the complexity of a gas car. I'd rather just have the complexity of the EV, which honestly is not terribly complex. The maintenance on an EV is a lot lower because there's so many fewer parts. Engines and transmissions have a lot of parts. In fact, I believe an engine and a transmission alone without the rest of the car has more parts than most EVs do, especially if you, you know, compare them to a Tesla Model 3 or a Tesla Model Y. There's more parts in the engine and the transmission alone than the entire electric car. I would rather have less complexity. If my drive motor fails, you replace my drive motor. If my battery fails, you replace the battery. And by the way, for these people who have these uh, irrational fears of having to pay, oh no, I'm going to have to pay $20,000 to get a new battery for my Tesla. First of all, that's not true. When you buy a new electric vehicle, um, if you were to look at the uh, sales paper for my car, for example, there's a bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty for 50,000 miles. The battery warranty is 100,000 miles. And after that battery has reached 100,000 miles, you don't know if the health is going to have depreciated that much. Because the reality is a lot of people aren't driving as much as I'm driving. Like I can easily put like 200 miles on a car within just a weekend just driving around. And the reality is a lot of these senior citizens, you know, they don't drive that much. A lot of, a lot of people who would appreciate a car like that, you know, they an 80% or 90% battery health, they're fine with that because they wouldn't charge it to 100% anyway. Uh, if you charge my battery to 85%, that gives you 287 miles. Now, if you charge it to 100%, it gives you 307 miles. But they tell you not to charge it to 100% because they want to preserve the battery health. So the reality is 
Just because the battery's health decreases doesn't mean that the vehicle's not usable. But again, I have people all the time, oh yeah, well you better watch out because if your battery starts to die, you're going to have to pay billions of dollars. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I have a warranty for 100,000 miles. I got eight years, 100,000 miles. Five years, 50,000 miles bumper to bumper. Like these people come up with this bullshit and I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't own one of these cars. So stop trying to tell me shit when I actually own one. It's like, what are you talking about? But it, it's just, it's absolutely remarkable. Like you got people who say anything. And then the worst thing is some of these dumbasses. They're spreading this bullshit, and then you got other people parroting the information, and they don't know what they're talking about. So now you got a bunch of people saying the same shit based on something that they saw on the news. Like, first of all, 2023 and 2024. Do you really think that the winters of 2023 and 2024, do you really think that all the people who've been buying Teslas since 2012, you really think that none of them have experienced any of this before? Do you really think that none of them have experienced a battery dying because they didn't realize that they had to precondition the car? Do you really? Th the problem is that They've had record sales within the last couple of years with the Model 3 and the Model Y. Now that so many of these people have bought these cars, a lot of them have been fortunate because we had mild winters. This past winter was very cold, and in some places they had a lot of ice, a lot of snow, and a lot of cold. So in those places specifically, yeah, they got hit really hard, and they hadn't, how should I say, they hadn't planned well when it came to being you know, at the charger or what time they needed to be at the charger. And then on top of that, you got all of these taxi limousine ride share guys and they're lined up because I've taken video of this. These guys are lined up trying to charge the cars. Meanwhile, regular citizens who are just driving their cars and want to charge, they've got to wait in line behind all these people, you know, or there's the other nightmare situation where it may get so cold that the Tesla charger may fail, or it may get so ridiculously hot that the Tesla charger may fail. But that doesn't normally happen unless you're dealing with extreme temperatures. That's why if you look at those videos, yeah, Alberta, Canada, I think maybe Detroit, and maybe like, like it was the parts of America that was so freaking cold. It's like, it's like, yeah, yeah, I understand it's that cold when you live out in the center of the damn country, but I live in New York. It doesn't get that cold here. It doesn't get that hot here. It's not like Texas. So it's just it's just amazing. It's like you got to argue with people who don't know shit, have no money, watching television, watching YouTube, and then they're coming up with all these ideas about shit they can't even afford. It's just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But, uh, you know, that's just what it is. So bottom line is March 5th. I'll be watching and waiting. I want to see what this uh, Dodge uh, thing, whatever they call it. I honestly don't even know what they're going to really call it because, you know, the, the Banshee was a concept. So we're going to find out all the official stuff in a couple of days. It should be interesting to see it. And, um, you know, and then, and then I'll make another video and talk about what they uh, put out there. And uh, we'll just go from there. To be continued.